I had mixed feelings about leaving the reserve. Where I would go, what I would do. I didn't think much of it, coming to the city, getting into the city, being there. Everything felt normal. I was going to school for web development. I remember thinking I have family in the area too. I just didn't realize how much family would be a key in my success. First thing in reserve for me was different because, you know, I've never really left the reserve for a long period of time. And when I left, it was usually just for, you know, a day trip or a sports trip or something for a week or two. But this time I was actually gone for a long period of time. So, yeah, there was obviously um, lots of fear, doubt, um, questions. But um, I remember just taking all in stride and saying, hey, you know what, it'll work out. Yeah, when I first moved to the city, I was going to school. Um, like I said, I didn't really realize what was happening until I was in the middle of it, you know, um, trying to find things to eat, trying to find places to go that, you know, to do things that I do, not just fall into the scene, right? And it happened so quick that it was like, oh man. But that kind of all hit me when I was just boom, on my own. Like I said, having family makes everything a lot easier, though. But you can't always bring family everywhere you go. And that's part of life. Being completely alone on my own for the first time felt fine. It felt normal, you know, just like going to the city for a day for a trip or going to the city to grab some groceries. Didn't think much of it at the time. It wasn't until a few weeks into my journey that I realized that, hey, I need to find a place to, you know, eat, stay in shape, do what I do. Just getting behind on I guess almost bills early, you know, paying a whole lot to stay there and then to get around transportation, having just X, X amount of dollars to eat what I want to eat and then not being able to eat what I want to eat, not having the resources, being back home to traditional foods, medicines and whatnot. So I find myself eating, you know, McDonald's, and KFC, you know, whatever I could. Yeah, you know, um, I kind of noticed that food was becoming an issue with my um, health and everything mental stableness, everything, just that I wouldn't feel the energy, I wouldn't have the energy to uh, study, to go out and do things that I'd be doing, just it really took its toll on me because I'm used to eating more traditional foods, whether it be berries, uh, moose meat, salmon, things of that nature. Hey! What's up, cuz? Cousin? Good man, how have you been? I've been really good. How's life in the big city? Oh, you know, it's been pretty good, man. Just taking care of classes and all that. Um, yeah, but I've been alright. How have you been? I'm alright, man. So are you getting along alright or what? Yeah, everything's pretty good, but it's been weird trying to find places to eat and traditional foods and whatnot. Like, I've been eating McDonald's and Wendy's, KFC. Like, 
I just haven't felt like myself and yeah. Why, why don't you go down the keg and get a steak or something like that? Did that the one night, yeah. Had a nice steak, ate some food, it was good. But um, yeah, I've, I've been running out of money, man. I've been spending all my money on nice food. I've been pretty much broke and I've been eating, like I said, pretty much junk food. I tell you what, you should call my my little cousin Mookie because my auntie, his mother, she makes them, she has a bunch of moose meat, raspberries, and uh, salmon from back home. And she can hook you up. She can, uh, you know, family, we all take care of each other, so. Appreciate that, man. Yeah, I haven't had anything traditional or real in months. And I feel it. I feel it is wearing on me. Yo, I appreciate that, cousin. Yes. If you could pass a, pass a number along, your name along, and we could figure it all out. I'll okay. figure that out. Thank you yeah, so I'll much. I'll pass you Mookie's number and he'll get a hold of you, okay? Sounds good, bro. Thank you. Okay, man. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Hey. Hey, Mookie, right? Yep. Right on. My cousin here. said you'd be coming. Stuff. Cool. Thanks. Come on in, man. Mm-hmm. It's good. All right. It's really good. <laughs> that. Can I you? Here, you want some? Put your hand up. You managed to put your hand I can see why you're missing the stuff. <laughs> I missed home, but it was the food. The food was the connection, right? Being able to find, what, what am I going to eat, right? It, was, it took its toll on me a little bit. So when I ended up finding my cousin through in the city and his mom had all the food, the traditional medicine, the berries, um, moose meat, and I was brought to me, I felt I felt reconnected back with home through yeah, what I eat and you know what I do throughout the day, what makes me feel like me. It just changed everything. I felt more grateful for those berries, for the meat, for everything, and you know, because I never really had to go without it. I never really had to go out and, so, you know, our people are so accustomed to finding our food in a sense that we're going out, we're finding it, we're shooting it, we're harvesting it, so on and so forth. So I was going out and I was trying to find my food in an area that I'm not familiar with. It just felt like it was one with, one with everything, almost like, you know, this moose it gave to me, right? The, the berries, like, it comes from the land, it's giving back to me. So just that, yeah, that feeling of reconnecting with myself, the earth, everything, right? Not alone. United. Hi, my name is Julie Nice. I'm from Kitsum Kalem, Terrace, British Columbia, part of the Simchian Nation. And today we'd like to talk about traditional harvesting in urban settings. Uh, you may not know it, but there are natural resources at your fingertips. You may, may not have. Part of my background in this area, I started with um, blueberry picking with my parents as a young child. And then as I grew older, um, my auntie, Rena Point Bolton, she's a medicine lady uh, from Simshian and Stolo Nation. And my brother and myself would help her with her gathering process. If she needed some plants or fruits or whatever, she'd let us know and we would go out and get them for her. Sometime in people's lives, they leave the village for one reason or another, to go to college or to move away and help a family member. And once they're away from home, they realize that they're away from a lot of things besides family. They start missing things and traditional foods is one of the major uh, missing components. Choke cherries we find in the lower mainland. They're kind of a high bush tree and they hang like grapes. And you can't really eat them raw because that's why they give have the name choke cherries. It gives you itchy throat. So that process, the jarring process takes that away 
and um, it makes the best jam. It's so red and tastes so sweet. Wild blueberries. There's so many ways you can process wild blueberries. You could just dry them uh, for teas later on, or you could freeze them for smoothies or just to eat later on in pies, or you can jam them to make syrup or just preserves. Devil's Club in Somalia is one oops, and it's gathered in springtime and fall time. It's the best harvesting time for it. It's when they're dry inside and the needles on the outside aren't alive, so you could just scrape off the spines, the thorns, to get to the center part. That's what you're going to harvest. You can make a salve out of it, which is boiling down the inside and then mixing it in with uh, olive oil or a Vaseline to make it into a rub. Or you can dry the little chunks of it and you can boil that for a tea to drink daily. Saskatoon berries would have been full of life and you'll find bushes like this in the city settings all over the place down by the river banks. They're bright blue like blueberries and they make the perfect jam. And then over here you'll see the soap berries which will be the first thing in springtime ready. And you get either green or red soap berries and this is widely used for um, bone ailments like arthritis and stuff like that or the berries are just used to eat. We whip them up with sugar and other fruits just to make like an Indian ice cream. With good harvesting practices though you do have to learn your surroundings. There are berries that are not um, good for eating. There are berries that are poisonous and they do look similar to the ones that aren't. So you do have to ask around, look at um, pictures, the internet to see what is good and what isn't. So, and if you're unsure, ask somebody. Don't just go eating stuff you don't know if it's safe or not. But the best thing is practice. Scout out your area, look around, get used to your surroundings. You'll find good patches that you can return to year after year. Jushkum Siwigot is how we describe someone who has lost their identity and connection to their culture and like their sense of belonging due to being apprehended into care, being labeled non-status by the government, or leaving their territory to seek education and employment in urban areas. As a Gitsan, we have a predestined inheritance of our grown up Gualyans while still in our mother's womb. And our Gualyans is everything. It's our will, our lahip, our culture. Our lahip is our honey toh, our food table. We've always been taught. And it's important that we sustain our lahip for all the children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren's children who will come after. I grew up as a Bill C-31 non-status Indian. So I and all my siblings, we grew up with no Indian status until we were all grown up. But we were fortunate enough later in life that our grandmother on my father's side took us under her wing and taught us. I believe that technology plays a huge role in distraction and disconnection from the world around us. Many find themselves lost in a world of information instead of the beauty around us. Our history is mainly oral and physical, and much of that gets lost in information technology. So I think finding a healthy balance between the two, using the technology that we have around us, while also remembering the teachings and culture of our ancestors is a great way to preserve our culture in the years to come. The land isn't as it used to be. We're getting to a state that no longer feels like home. The industrial development that is made continues to harm the environment. 
and the environment is what we live off of, so it's, you know, it's really important to us. For example, the, the fish, where the population of fish has decreased dramatically. Growing up as a, as a First Nations, a, I was able to go with my grandparents to, to their, to their lachiep, to their fishing ground, and I'd be able to spend all day there listening to the stories that they had to tell. And nowadays that's, that's hard to do because it, it just doesn't feel the same as it used to. And it's scary to think that if industries continue to do what they're doing to the land, then home will never be the same. Sarah uh, Lugi, maiden name, and um, I belong to the Frog Clan. The lullabies are part of our communication system, part of our oral, oral history. I think because I grew up with it, Everywhere we traveled, even in our nation, or with two then cousins and families, extended families, we used to hear them singing to their siblings and to their families too. So it was always incorporated as an everyday thing. So I kind of grew up with it. So to me, it wasn't something new. It was part of my culture. When we lost our language through residential school, I think a lot of that uh, got lost through the system. And also a lot of our children got adopted out and that got lost in the system there too, so. But it'll be kind of nice for our generation to, re to um, renew that, that uh, communication. So you can just gently stroke while you're singing, or else just go like this with the eye along the eyebrows, nice and gentle, and you'll be, you'll be sure to find them fast asleep. When I was young, we had very large extended family. And we used to practically live together throughout the summertime during uh, hunting and fishing season. And during this time, anytime there's a baby or a toddler or an infant, they'd always sing the, the, the lullabies to them. The lullaby is just basically just a continuous rhythmic <coughs> sound. And there's a few words to it basically, baby go to sleep, baby go to sleep. So it's just repetitious, eh? Because it's repetitious, you can add on your grandchildren's name or your family name. As soon as my grandchildren came into the world, right from the time they were born, I was singing it to them. And I taught my daughter-in-law and my sons how to sing the lullaby. Now even their non-First Nations um, grandparents sing it to them too. And I was just amazed to hear that, you know, that uh, the non-Aboriginal um, uh, grandpa was singing it to them. They said, oh yeah, our Fraser Lake grandpa sings to us. <laughs> also my dad was so, I think he was a really artistic man. He we used to have a cat, His, her, uh, her name was Penny, she was a great big huge uh, gray cat. And he used to sing to all our kittens, all the, the mums and the little kittens. And the babies, they used to go to sleep singing the lullabies. It was just so beautiful to witness that. <laughs> You know, I really feel proud and excited that there's a revitalization of our communication system. And like anything else, I think we should revive, like we're, today we're all reviving our language, renewing our culture. I think lullaby should be renewed too. I'm going to sing a little lullaby, a uh, carrier lullaby, which I grew up with, and it's a very old lullaby. It's so simple. All you need to do is know the rhythm, and you can even join me afterwards. Basically, the name of it is Ewe, Ewe, Baby Nenugu, Baby Nenugu. In other words, just um, Baby Go to Sleep baby go to sleep, putting it in simple terms. So Ewe is just a rhythm that you you, you keep um, humming or singing all throughout. And you can even use the baby's name before you start if you want, that's entirely up to you. I would like to see 
all moms singing lullabies to their baby, whether they make it out of their own or improvise or, but I always use their name, make sure to use their name. Their naming is very important. What art means to me as a Gitsan First Nations woman is a reconnection and just like a reconnection to our past. When I'm drawing, just the feeling of creating something. I think of my dad, who's also an artist. What an inspiration he was to me growing up. It makes me feel closer to my culture. Growing up with parents who went to residential school, and they never really talked about it. Um, my dad did eventually, and it was the hardest thing I've ever had to experience was listening to all of his stories and all of his hurt and all of his pain and not knowing how to help him. So my parents, they, um, they were the last generation in residential school, and I was the first that didn't go just, it was very hard um, just growing up with their trauma and I felt like I had to carry it. And it's still hard. And how he found his strength was through art. He said that that's how he survived. And it's so great to see First Nations art out there, like all the beautiful murals in all the towns. There's the past murals were all about colonizers and the church or Canada. Or they were always celebrated. And so First Nations people were always, you know, we weren't recognized, we weren't celebrated in any way. As a First Nations woman, um, growing up, I didn't see a lot of Native women artists. And uh, so it was very hard for me to um, feel confident in starting. Yeah, my grandmother, Mildred, my husband's grandmother, she was such an inspiration to me, and uh, she was one of the first female artists that I met. And that was just so amazing to me, because she did carving, she did paintings, and... I, it was just amazing to see all these old photos of her with her carvings and she never really talked about it and that was one of the things that um, First Nations women, they don't do, they don't, they don't promote themselves, they don't, um, just because it's not not a lot of women did it. So to see her and all of her artwork and all of the work she did with, with Kits and Calum, it was just so inspirational. And she just took me as her granddaughter and it really meant a lot to me. Art was always a language for us. With totem poles 
totem poles are used to tell the stories of all the house groups. And that was a way to tell the stories and just to connect. And it's just a good way to connect to the younger generation. Yeah, there's definitely more pride in our culture. It's more celebrated now with uh, social media because we can easily share photos and stories and it's just instant. It connects us to our past, but it could also be a part of our future. So we never forget. Um, we just carry it on. I find that we are, we are celebrating ourselves more and more and we're gaining more confidence and art is the message. A world we got at Kuldam Kapun, Timul Koitikshin, Dim Kudishkin, Bahni Itskinagi, Bahni Itskinagi, Neewal Stowa, we am a Bashamana, Mansak at the West, Shaya Kudam Square. A world that we got at Kuldam Kapun, Timul Koitikshin, Dim Kudishkin.